The Christian's faith differs from all the religions in the world in this way. Religions and religious teachers teach men the precepts they must follow in order to be happy in this world and or the world to come. And they urge men to discipline themselves to follow those teachings. Christians, however, believe that all men already know the teachings they should follow. So they not only do not need more teaching, but are so hopelessly bad that they neither can nor want to follow God's laws. Because of mankind's utter depravity and hopeless sinfulness, God himself sent Jesus to take away sin for men and as their representative in their stead. Jesus did this on the cross. There, while being rejected and mocked by men, he became also as the embodiment and personification of man's sin, the object of God's wrath and judgment against mankind. So now the problem of sin, all sin, is gone. God counts ungodly men righteous. God wants us to simply believe this and be happy about it. More than that, God has promised that whoever believes in Jesus and trusts God's word concerning the forgiveness of our sins because of Jesus' death, to this man he will give his spirit. That is, his spirit will come into those who believe and they will become new men, born anew into his kingdom, with different hearts, with both the strength and desire to be righteous. This is the gospel, the good news, that is the subject of the following chapter, excerpts from the writings of Jesus' disciple, Paul. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes for in it God's righteousness is revealed out of faith into faith just as it is written the one who becomes righteous by faith will live for to those who are perishing, the message of the cross is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is God's power. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the understanding of the experts. Where is the philosopher? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. 
from the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals and reptiles. Therefore God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual intercourse for what is unnatural. The males in the same way also left natural sexual intercourse with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their perversion. And because they did not think it worthwhile to have God in their knowledge, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, disputes, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know full well God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of His kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth 
but are obeying unrighteousness. Affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory, honor and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. There is no favoritism with God. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Vipers' venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. But now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, which is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is, in Christ Jesus. God presented him as an offering of atonement through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed by mankind. This righteousness will be credited to us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, through Him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. For while we were still helpless, at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us, in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by His blood, we will be saved through Him from wrath. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the dead of His Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by our flesh, God did. He condemned the sin in our flesh by sending His own Son in flesh like ours and as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to our fleshly desires but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh think about the things of the flesh. But those whose lives are according to the Spirit about the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God, because it does not submit itself to God's law for it is unable to do so. Those whose lives are in the flesh are unable to please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the lusts of the body, you will live. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Now in this hope we were saved. Yet hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings, and He who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset, because He intercedes for us sacred ones 
according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called, and those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also, with him, grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus.